Okay, so today we will be going to the next verse, which is the 16th one of chapter 7. So we will chant that. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Chatur Vida Bhajante Maam Chatur Vida Bhajante Maam Jana Sukriti Rojana Jana Sukriti Rojana Arto Jigna Surat Parti Arto Jigna Surat Parti Yani Chabharat Arshabha Yani Chabharat Arshabha So, if you look at the last verse, he says Dushkriti no Muda. He talked about the Dushkritinas. The one who have done um, bad deeds in their past. And now he talks about Sukritinas. The one who have done good deeds in this life or in the past life. So the ones who have done bad deeds have had Papam. And the ones who have done good deeds have got Punyam. So he says, Jana, Janaha, Sukratinaha. As opposed to Sukratinaha. People who have done good deeds. People who are bhaktas. And he says such bhaktas. So this sukritina is the important word here. The classification that is now going to come is of janaha sukritinaha. Of the people who are bhaktas. Who have done good deeds. Who have got punyam. And Krishna classifies into four different classes. Chaturvidha. I am classifying into four classes he says. Chaturvada Bhajante Maam. So Bhajante Maam is just indicating that these are bhaktas. They actually worship me. And the first one is Arthaha. Arthaha is a... Arthi is a crisis. So this is not the Arthi which is the one which you do in, you know, puja. So this is Arthaha. It's a crisis. So Arthaha is crisis bhaktas. So these people, they are generally not Bhaktas, but they remember the Lord only when there is a crisis. Whenever there is a crisis, suddenly devotion, you know, flares up in their hearts. And Shankara gives a definition. He says, Artaha means Arti Parigrahitaha. Parigrahita means surrounded by or, or bound by or in the firm grip of. Therefore, Artaha is people who are Parigrahitaha, firmly in the grip of Arti. Arti is distress, sorrow. So whenever this person is in difficulty, so there is suddenly there is an examination and he is not prepared, or suddenly he has got into very difficult problems in his in his job, and there is no other source of help, and that is very important, right? There is no other source of help, and then only he turns to Ishvara. It is not that he turns to Ishvara whenever there is some help available elsewhere, but he turns only to Ishwara, only when he has no other source. And then he turns only to Ishwara, because when the whole world has turned its back upon you, there is only one person who has not, and that is Ishwara. And Shankara, to illustrate this point, he gives three examples. He says, like a person who is Taskara Abhibhutaha. Taskara is a thief. A robber. A robber who's got a weapon. Abhibhutaha is 
being overpowered by. So, Taskara Abhibhutaha, like the person who has been overpowered by the thief. The thief has got a gun to his head or a knife to his throat and he is threatening his life. So, this person, he is forced to give the money to the thief. He cannot shout for help also because there may be neighbors, there may be even somebody in the next room, you know, but he cannot shout for help because the moment he shouts, the thief will kill him and therefore totally helpless. It's a good example that, that there is, there may be help available, but you just cannot utilize it. So, Taskara Abhibhutaha, one who is overpowered by the thief. And then he gives one more example, Vyagra Abhibhutaha. So, Vyagra is a tiger. And when you are overpowered by a tiger, when the tiger is, you know, standing with both his legs on your chest, there is nothing much you can do, right? And even if there is somebody around you, they are not going to help you because they would be running for their own lives. So, Vyagra Abhibhutaha, this person also is completely Artaha. He is helpless in the face of a obstacle which he cannot overcome. And there is a more uh, Shankara again. In Shankara only gives the example. It's a more, uh, you know, uh, something which many of us are familiar with, some situation. So you may not be familiar with a thief putting a knife at your throat or a tiger sitting on your chest. But this third situation we are very familiar with. And this may not be uh, on your own account, but you may have seen it with neighbors or your own parents or your own grandparents or something. So he says, Rag, Roga Adinam Abhibhutaha. Overpowered by disease. And this many of us have experienced. Some, some people at the personal level. Some people at the level of relatives. So overpowered by disease means what? The disease never seems to go away. You go on from hospital to hospital. Doctor to doctor. You know, one examination to another examination. You have an MRI. You have... You know, Hundreds of investigations, the rounds never seem to stop. And what is more, <clears throat> you feel worse after each visit. So, Rogadina Abhibhuta, overpowered by disease. And those of you who are unfortunate enough to have been there will know that the overwhelming sense of helplessness, that fate is against me. Right? And uh, there are examples, of course, in the Puranas. You have, for example, Ahilya, your Panchali. All these are examples of this. People who are Arthas, completely overpowered by fate, circumstances. So such people, since they don't have anywhere to turn to, only Ishwara is left. And they turn to Ishwara. So it's involuntarily coming to Ishwara. Okay, right. Then the next one is, now I am rearranging this, but the sequence here is Arthaha Jignyasu. If you look at the words, the second line says Artha Jignyasu Surartarthi. The second word has to be broken as Jignyasu. The first word is Arthaha. Second word is Jignyasu. The third word is Arthaarthi. Arthaarthi. The Jignyasu Arthaarthi. That is broken. The R is a joiner. You break up the R. It becomes Jignyasu and Artharthi. So there are four words. Arthaha, Jignyasu, Artharthi and Jnani. And for the sake of convenience, for discussion, I am taking the Artharthi first. Because Artharthi and Artaha are in one group. Right. And if you ask why it is, why did Krishna take it this way, then just interchange the meter. You see, Artho Surarthi Jignyasu, and you will see the meter goes all completely out of order. And therefore, for the sake of the Chanda, it has been put in this order. But the, the Chanda, Chanda order is this, the meter order is this, but the discussion order has to be Artharthi is second. So, Artharthi is a person who is who comes to Ishra, but he is not Artha, he is not Crisis Bhakta. But what is he? Ankara, you can make the word itself will tell you. Artha, Arthi. The one who wants Artha. Artha means with wealth over here. So Shankara defines this very specifically as Dhanakamaha, the one who has a desire for wealth. Right? The person who invokes the Lord for wealth. 
and therefore it is contractual bhakti. It's a business arrangement. And if you go to Tirupati, you will find, you know, you will find all these people who come there, all the businessmen who come there, and there they have this discussion with the Lord, you know, oh Lord, I got 10% profit this year, and out of that, I'm giving you your share of 10%. But if you give me 20% profit next year, naturally I'll be giving you 20%. So why don't you, you know, get in this business arrangement? But you give me more, I give you more. Very simple, contractual bhakti. Now, such a person. For him, remember, the Lord is a means towards the money, which is the end, right? And whenever there is a means towards the end, remember that the means are being utilized only for the accomplishment of the end. And often, when the end is achieved, the, the means are dropped. Therefore, for this person, he loves the Lord, he comes to the Lord, but he comes to the Lord only because he loves the end, the money more. And therefore, it is Artharthi. Okay. These two are in one category, Arthaha and Artharthi. Why? Because for both of them, God is only a means and not the end. That is why we rearrange the order. Then Jignyasu. So what is Jignyasu? Shankara says, Bhagavat Tattvam Gyatum Ichchati. Yaha. That person, Yaha, for whom Gyatum Ichchati, he has this deep desire to understand Bhagavan. He doesn't have any worldly desire, but he is a Bhakta who wants to know about the essential nature of Ishwara. Right? So here, what has happened, there has been a shift in perspective from Ishwara being the means or something, Ishwara has now become the end, right? And therefore, the first two is a lower form of bhakti, manda bhakti, we call it. The first two is classified under manda bhakti, the lowest forms of bhakti. Why? Because Ishwara is a means. And wherever Ishwara is a means, the bhakti is always classified as inferior bhakti, manda bhakti. And now, here in the Jignasu, Ishwara has stopped being the means, he has become the end. And therefore, the, the level has changed. And therefore, now it is Madhyama Bhakti, middling Bhakti. Earlier one is inferior. This is the middle form of Bhakti, Madhyama Bhakti. It's also called Nishkama Bhakti because this Sadaka is not asking for anything for himself. Because the moment he uses Ishwara to ask for something for himself, that Ishwara shifts back into the means category. But here it is the end category. So, he has no desires apart from knowing Ishwara. And that is Nishkama, without any desires. Nishkama Bhakti. In this case, what has happened? Ishwara is the only goal. And every other goal that he has in his life, remember that he will have other goals in his life. <clears throat> but every other goal that he has in his life will become subsidiary. So, he will Try to retain only those goals which help him to achieve his objectives. Only supporting goals are retained. Obstructive goals will be dropped. So you have Arthaha, Artharthi, Jignyasu and the fourth one is Jnani. So who is the Jnani? Shankara defines Vishnoho Tattvamitri. The one who knows the real nature of Vishnu. Vishnu is the Lord, Ishwara over here. One who knows the real nature of the Lord. And we saw, what is the real nature of the Lord? Para, apara. We saw in the first part of this chapter. So both he must know. And the Bhakta who has discovered this, knows that the Lord is not away from him. Because he has discovered that para, para bhava, the para shakti, that higher nature of the Lord, the para swarupam, he has discovered that it is the same as his own Swarupa, right? So he has discovered the Lord is not different from him. And therefore we say that he has accomplished the Lord. And therefore he is a Uttama Bhaktaha. The first two were Madhyama Bhaktaha, were Mandha Bhaktaha. The second one, the third one was Madhyama Bhaktaha. This person is Uttama Bhaktaha, the highest form of seeker. Why? Because he has discovered that he is 
that he is the Lord. So for him, God is <coughs> not a sadhanam. God is not the means. God is not a sadhyam. God is not the end also. For this person, Ishwara is neither sadhanam nor sadhyam. Neither the means nor the end. But what is he? He is Siddhaha. Ishwara. He is himself Ishwara. He has discovered that he is Ishwara himself. For him, Ishwara is neither sadhanam nor sadhyam. And therefore, <coughs> ananya bhakti, there is no other for him. For the first three, for the arthaha, artharthi and jignyasu, remember the Ishwara is paroksha. He is somebody away from the seeker. But for the jnani, the fourth category, Ishwara is aparoksha. It is immediate. He himself is... When you, whenever you say aparoksha, you mean in the nature of I myself. So, Ishwara is aparoksha. Not away from himself. Direct. Now, are we saying that being... Uh, any of the three bhakta, bhaktis, being in any of the three categories is a problem? No. Because you have to start off somewhere. Even artaha is a very good place to start. Because you have, the moment you say artaha, you are saying, I am a bhakta. Whenever you say, I am a bhakta, Ishwara is there in your life. So any of the three categories is not a problem. But one needs to grow. One needs to finally move into the fourth category, the jnani category. And Bharata Shabha simply means O oh, Bull among the Bharatas, O oh, most prominent among the Bharatas. And Krishna continues with the classification later. So we will chant the next verse. Number so Acharya Ji, can I ask a question? Please. So is the Nyani still labeled, called a Bhakta when he has a Paroksha Nyana? Nyani is the highest Bhakta. So when he understands that he's he's the he's the only one, there's no one yes. else. Then he, yes. Is he still a bhakta? He is still very much a bhakta. We will see as we will come to the next verse. You will be able to see. Ji. Okay. Let us look chat verse number seventeen. Tesham jnani nitya yukta. Eka bhaktir vishishyate. Eka bhaktir vishishyate. Eka bhaktir vishishyate. Eka bhaktir Okay, so this will answer Ritu's question. Who is the best among the yeah, among the four types of bhaktas? So he says Tesham. Tesham means what? Among. Among what? Among the four bhaktas that we are talking about, Tesham. Tesham Jnanihi. Yani he, Tatpavitya, the one who knows that he is Brahman, the one who knows that he is Atma. And what kind of person is he? Nitya Yuktaha. Ever connected with this Jnanam. Ever connected with Atma. Ever connected with the Lord. Because he is the Lord himself. He has become Ishwara himself. And therefore he is never away from the Lord. That is why Krishna says Nitya Yuktaha. Always connected. If you are the Lord, obviously you can never be disconnected from the Lord. Okay. And this particular statement when Krishna makes, he is referring to an earlier statement, Tasyaham na pranasyami sachame na pranasyati in the last chapter. Right? 30th verse. He says, this jnani, there he said what? I never lose sight of that person and that person never loses sight of me. So this is exactly what he is saying. Nitya Yuktaha is the abbreviation of that entire statement. Tasyaham na pranasyami sachame na pranasyati. This connection we, we must make. Eka bhakti hi, he says. Krishna says, eka bhakti hi. So that word breaks up into eka bhakti hi vishishyate. Eka bhakti hi, Shankara says, is advaita bhakti. Advaita bhakti hi is what? Non-dual bhakti hi. What is the definition of non-dual bhakti? 
Anyasya abhavat. Because of the fact that Anyaha is not there. No other God is there. Anyasya abhavat. This jnani, he does not have another Ishvara. Anyasya, separate from himself to worship. Right? That is the meaning, which is the correct meaning. But we should note here that the word Ekabhakti is a very important word for Vaishnavites as well as for people from organizations like ISKCON. Why Ekabhakti is Bhakti only towards one. What did we say? And that is why Shankara said Ekabhakti means Anyasya Abhavat because there is no other apart from himself. Right? But the Vaishnavite will say, Eka Bhakti means only Narayana. Ekaha refers to Narayana and therefore you should worship only Narayana and if you worship Shanka, uh, Shiva, then you are violating this mandate of Krishna. And of course, Iskon will go one step further and they will say, Eka Bhakti means only Krishna Avatar. Because for Iskon, Krishna Avatar, the personal God is Brahman. Right? So, for us, it is necessary to understand correctly. And very many sub-commentators say that the introduction of this verse here is to rule out, is to actually refute Dvaitam and Vishishta Dvaitam. Okay, this verse refutes both Dvaitam and Vishishta Dvaitam. Right? Which, okay, now, Vishishyate, Eka Bhakti, Vishishyate. Vishishyate here means uh, Adikam. Superior. So, Eka Bhakti Vishishyate means the one Advaita Bhakta is superior to the other three. So, excepting for, remember that excepting for Advaita Bhakti, any other Bhakti that you have, what is Advaita Bhakti? Self love. Okay, it's a very major statement to make here. Self love is always unconditional. Do you agree with the statement? Anybody? Yes. Yes, Sanjay. What is the logic? Because we do everything for our happiness. So that is fine. There is no other. So my self-love is unconditional. No. From which uh, incorrect so I am, I still love, love myself the way I am. And I love myself the way I am at every phase of my life. I'm progressing, but I'm also at that step, at that phase, accepting where I am. See, the normal human being, you know, he accepts or he loves himself the most. Right? There are no circumstances under which he will not love himself. But in his love for others, let us say even love for a spouse. There could be circumstances where that love is lost. Do you agree? Love for yourself is never lost. But love for anybody else can be lost. Yes. And therefore, when love for anybody else can be lost, it means when you say, when you agree that love for anybody else can be lost, it means there can come circumstances where that other person becomes non-lovable for you. And therefore, it's conditional love. But love for yourself can never be lost. And this is what Shankara said in one very famous verse. Yavad vitto parjana saktaha thavat nijana, nijana savat nija parivaro raktaha pascha jivati jazara dehe varto ko, vartam kopina prichati gehe. Remember? As long as you are an earning member, the family respects you. Right? Yavat vitto parjana sakta. As long as you are earning, contributing to the family wallet, tavat nija parivaro rakta. Your own family, they will be attached to you. Pascha jivati jarjara dehe. When your body becomes old and trembling and you lose your capacity to they will not even come to talk to you. You will be lying alone in one room, okay, waiting for the Lord Yama to land up. So, here again, the same idea is pointed out. 
that conditional love is there for everybody else. That same person who was husband, father and all is no longer wanted. And that is why we all feel that in old days we might feel get rejected. Not only that, this, con this particular idea is born out in an Upanishad called Brahadaranika Upanishad, which also we will do sooner or later. Very famous Vakyam. Atmanastu Kamaya Sarvam Priyam Bhavati. A very potent statement. Whoever you love, Sarvam Priyam Bhavati, whoever you love, Upanishad says, you love Atmanastu Kamaya. Only for your own self. Everyone is loved because of your own self. Why? Self-love is unconditional. All other love is conditional. You will love somebody only as long as that somebody is fulfilling some want of yours, some need of yours he is fulfilling. When that fulfilling need goes away or that person is no longer fulfilling your need, there is a possibility of your not loving that person anymore. And here Krishna is going one step further and he is saying even your love for Ishwara is conditional when, when Ishwara is separate from you. If that Ishwara you consider as different from you, which is what happens in Arthaha, Artharthi and Jinyasu, that condition will, that condition will be there. That my devotion will, my love will last only as long as Ishwara is favoring me. The moment, or maybe, maybe not the moment, when it seems that consistently Ishwara does not listen to you, then you will throw away all your, you know, murtis, you will stop going to the temple, you will stop praying, all that will happen. If self-love is the highest love, the question is, if this self-love is the highest love, then how can Ishwara, Ishwara's bhakti be called the highest love? Because that's what Krishna is saying. Eka bhaktir vishishyate. That one who worships Ishwara he is the highest bhaktaha. And he is a jnani. Okay. So remember that the love, love for Ishwara can be the highest only under one condition. What is that? You and Ishwara are the same. And it's important, very important to note this idea because, because this sloka is taken by many sub-commentators as a sloka to remove many misconceptions. What are the, let, us, let us look at some of the misconceptions. Many people say that Jnanam is difficult. And therefore, you know, who will come to class every Sunday for five years or ten years? And now, there's a, now of course, Acharya is saying, you have to go up all the ten Upanishads and then you have to do Brahma Sutra also. We are talking fifteen years. So, who is going to come to Sunday class every for fifteen years? Not me, right? So, let me choose a simpler method, Bhakti Yoga. So, Jnana Yoga is difficult, it's very dry. And uh, many Upanishads say that in Kali Yuga, Jnana Yuga is not possible. That they follow the Lord's name, just chant the Lord's name and you will get moksha. There are many, many Shruti statements that you just chant the Lord's name and that is sufficient. Now, the point is, is chanting the Lord's name enough? Right? So, in fact, Shankara says, in a text called Viveka Chudarmani that you can't cure a disease just by chanting the name of the medicine. It's like trying to cure a headache by simply getting up in the morning and saying you know, aspro, 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 aspro. Will that cure a headache? No. So ultimately, if you want to escape from Agnyanam, which is called Moksha, there is no help but to come to Jnanam. So even if you are a Bhakti Yogi, you have to come to Jnanam. You can do your karma yoga, you can do your bhakti yoga. What will they do for you? They will give you chitta shuddhi. But if you don't come to jnanam, you may have got chitta shuddhi, but you will be a very pure ajnani. Earlier you were an impure ajnani, now you will be a very, very pure ajnani. That is one misconception. Another misconception, that is a very, very uh, popular one, especially among the younger generation who don't know anything about the scriptures, but who want to do something, who want to show that they are you know, spiritual. 
what do they do meditate and they have quote the scriptures themselves to say that meditation alone will give you jnana now logically also in meditation what do you do you can recall something that you know that you already know not something that you don't know right and what is nidhi dhyasanam nidhi dhyasanam is meditation post shravanam maranam so what are you recalling in nidhi dhyasanam you are recalling that i am brahman aham brahma asmi iti and therefore that is worthwhile that nidhi dhyasanam is a worthwhile meditation because you are repeating on something which has a prayojanam but before you come to gyana you meditate you are only repeating what you don't know there is nothing shastram has told you which you can repeat because you have not come to shastram and therefore meditation any type of meditation post gyana meditation pre gyana meditation remember you can only recall what you know and pre gyana meditation you cannot recall that you are aham brahmasmi because you don't know and that is why krishna says tad vidhi pratipata pratipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadek upadekshyanti te gnanam gnana tatva darshina fourth chapter we saw if you want moksha you have to go to the guru you have to prostrate before him you have to serve him and you have to ask questions pariprashnena you have to ask questions you have to get knowledge and the only way is a systematic study of the scriptures for a you know long period of time under the guidance of a competent acharya and what type of scriptures any scripture which deals with ishvara swarupa so apara and para vidya which is saguna ishvara swarupam para apara vidya nirguna ishvara swarupam para vidya you have to deal with and therefore meditation cannot give you any prayojanam as far as moksha is concerned unless you have the knowledge already which means you have to come to gnana shastra is unavoidable a third misconception which is also very common which is whoever is a gnani he thinks he is ishvara he knows he is ishvara therefore he cannot have bhakti so this is answering ritu ji's question whenever yeah, this, is, this is a misconception that somebody who is a gnani cannot have bhakti and very often people say when gnanam comes bhakti leaves gnani is always arrogant so the person who thinks that when gnanam comes and bhakti leaves we often say that he has not understood gnanam nor has he understood bhakti and that is why krishna says here in the second line priya hi sorry वेरी आनंद स्वरूप द वेरी बेसिस ऑफ ऑल लव वेरी ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ ऑल लव is ananda and therefore this gnani he knows me as the dearest one i am the dearest one for that gnani i am the object of all love for the gnani and therefore one who loves me the most what is he for me he is the greatest devotee because he has identified himself with me and therefore i am dearest to him you should note the flow of this logic very important for us what is the what is the first statement we made self love is always the greatest love you don't need a pramanam for this your personal experience will show you anubhava will show you that you can love nobody more than you love yourself right what is the second statement krishna is saying that i atma am the very essence of the gnani the gnani jeevas essential nature is i the atma okay love for yourself love for oneself is the greatest love but the essential nature the very self of the gnani i am 
and we said love for one self is always the greatest love atma is the self of the gnani therefore atma is loved the most do you get the get the sequence you love yourself the most but the self in you is atma and therefore you love atma the most atma is ishvara therefore the gnani he loves ishvara the most and unless therefore the corollary here is that unless you have understood that ishvara to be none other than yourself unless that has happened your love for ishvara will always be less than your love for yourself the gnani his love for ishvara is the highest love because he his own self is ishvara does it make sense ji because you said that love is the highest love yes so ritu ji does that sort out your confusion ji ji acharya thank you acharya ji can i ask a question yes please go ahead uh, uh, how will it be different from being selfish uh, if i very, very good question don't get that when you say i am atma and when you say i am jivatma what is the difference atma is only the consciousness and jivatma is along with the jiva body identification is not there in atma when you say i am jivatma you are identified with that particular body mind sense complex which is anu agarwal when you say i am atma your your body is no longer that of just anu agarwal your body is what anatma virata no your body is samashti thula shariram virat and when the entire universe is included in, in your i where is the question of being selfish selfishness is possible only when there is i and somebody else but there is no second person there because your i includes the whole universe as atma anu ji does that make sense uh, yes it makes sense acharya ji but then uh... we as jivatmas we you know i see people who are taking care only of themselves their own bodies their own needs and then uh, that kind it's then it's not samashti you know which people in general i mean i can see people <clears throat> in yeah, the world are you saying that a gnani takes care only of himself then only your statement is worth is correct yes If you are saying Agnani is taking care of themselves, that's fine. That's the way they are. But that is not what is being said here. He is okay. saying Eka Bhaktar Vishishtate. You are when you say I am Ishvara, you are not the individual Jivatma. In that I is included the whole world. People will definitely take Agnani yes. will definitely take care of only of himself. Yes. But a but a Agnani for him the whole world is his body, and therefore you will find that he will. be compassionate he will do things for others because he doesn't need to do anything for himself he has already achieved all that there is to be achieved yes. okay so, so that is the content of the so much energy yes please uh, so what's the di- difference between love and devotion in in this uh, context sorry come again other? love and devotion difference between the word love and devotion in other context and this context i mean in in, in bhagavad gita no don't use when you are asking such questions you should ask in the sanskrit words because you are la- interpreting oh. it differently yeah. now where are you saying here love and oh. devotion okay. uh, you see the difference you see the difficulty devotion is also english word i am not talking about english at all is it there in this text where which word in the text indicate that there is love and which text indicates that is devotion which and there are two different things no, we are using these two words that like bhagwan because it's english i have to explain in english uh, so but when we are talking about 
Uh, sorry, Azaria. When, when we're talking about... Difference, hmm. when, you, when you say there's a difference, you're using differently, you have to point towards the original part of the text where it is used differently. I'm using it for explanation, which is different. I am not saying Krishna said love is different from devotion. There is no such word at all in this particular verse. He says bhakti. Yes. There's only one word. Okay. Uh, what I understood or understand that when we talk about bhakti, we use the word devotion. No. And that is a very English translation. Mm -hmm. Bhakti, yeah, there is, true really devotion problem. means there is love. You cannot separate the two words. You may, and explaining, yeah. I may say bhakti because uh, devotion because I'm trying to explain the viewpoint of a, of a devotee, of a, of a sadhaka. But from the jnani's point of view, he loving his own self, which he considers Ishwara. And therefore, that bhakti and that love and devotion, there is no, no, no change over here. You can use, use an interchange. Mm -hmm. Yes, Acharya. Then the confusion doesn't come. Actually, I, I, what I understand, the confusion is coming because of these two words, actually, and the meaning of love and devotion. So you use it as love, if it makes you happier. <laughs> yeah, that should be better because devotion means someone else and I'm devoted to that. That no, kind of concept is... Devotion means you are considering yourself as one of the other three categories. Um, Love means yes. you are considering yourself in the jnani category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually. Thank you Remember so much. that whenever you say I in a Shastric environment, you should be extremely clear what that I is. Here, the I is jnani, not artha, artharti, or Dignes, in this discussion at least. So I wanted to just ask that for people who don't have a good self-image or, uh, you know, they live in self-doubt, blame, uh, self-guilt, and then uh, naturally their self-love is also compromised. So for them to reach the stage of Jnani or the stage of Advait Bhakti, the primary step is to improve their self-image and then you know, from there only they can start. Otherwise, they'll never be able to uh, identify Ishwara with themselves because their I only is very weak. Well, I'll put it this way, you know, that if the when you say my I don't like myself, let us say that statement is being made, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. For people who doubt themselves and don't love themselves. No, the point I would say is that there is nobody because the Shastra is extremely clear. Atmanastu Kamaya. Everybody will love because of yourself only. Therefore, if somebody doesn't love himself or even hates himself, you know, I would say look at the root of that. Let me give you an example. Um, okay. There is a person who is, uh, you know, well, let us say who is very deeply in, de in debt. He owes somebody, say, $10 million. Okay, now he doesn't know how to get that money, so he decides to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say he loves himself? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. No, if you love himself, then why would he commit suicide? Because he is in pain and he doesn't want to give pain to himself. So he wants freedom and freedom is something that... Yes. So, uh, so there you are saying, in spite of such a severe problem, he still loves himself. Then how do you make a statement that I have a reduced self-image? But that's an extreme step. Not yes. everybody takes that, but people continue to live in self-doubt, self-blame. No, everything basically remember... You are superimposing the dislike of the of the particular circumstances in which you find yourself onto yourself. It is adhyasa only. If you find that consistently you have been making wrong decisions and therefore you have got self-doubt and therefore you have self, low self-image, what is it that you really dislike? Yourself or your inability to take correct decisions? Yeah, it's circumstantial. Every self-doubt that you have or every, every problem that you have is based in an object or a, or, a, or a quality which you have. 
and therefore it is that quality of yours which you are disliking not yourself if suddenly you went for a course where you you know you i'm not saying it happened okay suddenly let us say you went for a one month course somewhere and they hammered all this out of you and made you a very good decision maker would you still have doubts no therefore remember that any time you say i don't i have a low self image it is you are superimposing there is adhyasa you are superimposing your dislike of some problem onto your own self that dislike of the problem is is transformed into a dislike of yourself mm-hmm. you never dislike yourself it is adhyasa only what well, thank you sir so that yeah based on the the suicide part uh, sorry can you repeat like so he is doing it out of uh, uh, love or uh, that's only because it he is doing it because he dislikes the fact that he owes somebody money so that ananda is not there or that self love is not there in that okay let's make it more uh, you know like, let's say that you know you have been i mean not you okay let's say a person x a girl x has been rejected by her boyfriend and and she's in very deep depression and she's about to jump off a cliff would you say there is self love or self hate that's hate okay it's self hate and supposing the boyfriend suddenly comes and says okay okay i'm very sorry come with me will that change the decision yes will the self hate suddenly transform into self love yes so what is there is it is that possible that hate transforms into love so what you have done is just simply remove the irritant your dislike is always of the irritant of the environmental factor which is causing your problem never of yourself a person who commits suicide doesn't hate himself he hates the factor which is driven him you know which is which he unable to live with understood actually and thank you it's very important understanding for all of us there is no such thing as self hate we always dislike a circumstance not us you never hate yourself and that's what krishna is saying here okay okay let's go to the next part of the of the mantra the of the shloka the second line sacha mama priya so he said that i am the dearest one priyo hi gyanina atyartham that is i am the dearest one for the gyani the gyani considers me as the his love for me is the most why because he sees himself as me only that is from the gnani view point now he says sacha mama priya for me also that gnani is the dearest one first it was said that ishvara is the atma of the gnani and therefore the gnani loves ishvara the most and now he is saying that that gnani is my own self also is my atma ishwara is saying that gnani is my atma i also have got self love for me also self love is the greatest love and since that gnani is my atma i also love the gnani the most two very important statements ishwara loves the gnani the most because the gnani is no different from ishwara and ishwara also has self love as the maximum the same statement is there for the gnani also the gnani self love is the maximum but ishvara is the gnani's atma and therefore gnani also loves ishvara the most so this is with this we'll stop for today any questions you let me know very two very very important verses and it's extremely important for us to understand how these verses are putting forward some vedantic truths that there is no such thing as self hate why because you have to love, you you are loving only yourself ultimately and remember that if there are people for example you can take an example you know in i don't know have you read the tale of two cities anybody charles dickens okay fine it's not there in the textbooks nowadays it seems all right so let's let me tell you there 
um, somebody no, somebody prefers to die rather than cause any harm to somebody else okay how will you explain that in terms of this that he loves himself the most because he gets happiness only by helping others he will say that if this x person let us say take the example of a mother and child okay if the child is in danger and the only option to change to save that child is the mother's life will the mother choose to die no <laughs> anybody, anybody disagree <laughs> Acharya ji, did you say that if the only option to save the child will be to give her own life, I think yes. his mother will choose to die. Yes. Correct. That is correct. As much as you may think not, any of you who are mothers, you put yourself in a place where that your child is in danger, and the only option is by that you are putting yourself in danger, and the possibility is very high that you will die. Will you do it or not? You will. At least I hope you will. <laughs> All the time at the time of childbirth, it is always, and especially right. if it is a critical birth or something like that. So that is okay, but I am saying deliberately you are getting and doing an action which endangers you to save that office. There are so many examples, right? People have so put themselves in danger. Save our children. Sorry. We will go all out to save our children exactly. in donating blood or whatever. Is so, what is it that is doing that? Is that not endangering yourself? It is, but yes. why? Because you are putting the happiness of your child as exactly. your own happiness, not above yes. you. I'm not saying above your happiness. I'm saying your mm -hmm. the happiness of your child. You're equating with your own happiness. Yes. You would not want to live with the thought that I did not do anything to save my kid. Sure. So, for you, your child's happiness is as good as yours. And therefore, there is no selfishness. That's the point I'm trying to make. That in self-love, there is no selfish selfishness at all. And of course, at the level of the Atma, every, everybody is you only. So the question of selfishness cannot come at all because there is no other person. Selfishness is possible only when there is another person. There are two levels. One is a level where the individuals are there, which we can relate with, where a person is so close to you that his happiness is more important to you than yours. Giving your life in such a case, there is no sacrifice at all. You do it willingly. Acharya ji, because we are humans with intellect, can I share a small story? It's like from a childhood uh, memory from Akbar Birbal's story. Like yeah, Akbar yeah, please go ahead. asked Birbal, and then he said uh, that uh, self is the most important. He put a, a female monkey with her ch child in a tub of water, deep pit of water. And then he keep, kept on filling it with water. And the, uh, the female monkey initially, she kept on trying to save the child. She lifted to the shoulder, then to the head. But ultimately, when the water starts coming to her nose, she puts her own child down and stands on the child to save the child. This is uh, just a memory from an Akbar Birbal story. So I shared that uh, when one doesn't have intellect, even that can it's, happen. That it's instinct. You know, it's instinct. instinct. That's animal instinct, yeah. So that basically that animal doesn't study Vedanta, <laughs> but it, yeah. knows, yeah. it knows that child happiness is more important That's than the life. the difference of the intellect, yeah. Yeah. It is only when you can think, you know, then you say things like, okay, okay, maybe I should save myself and I can have another child later on. So, Acharya, it's about now since we are in the topic, so helping others. Uh, so, if you have a scenario between, you know, should you choose yourself or um, take care of others at that moment? Um, so, you mean to say end of the day, self-love? No, okay. Can you come again? So suppose we have two scenarios about like, okay, you want to save yourself or save others. Uh, mother and son scenario is different, I think, but otherwise, nowadays, uh, with the you know helping nature, uh, suppose financial, or anything. So, uh, so is it uh, now? I'm a bit confused. Like, should we give priority to the self love? Okay, take care, 
So right. I'll I'll give you an example here. Another example. It is a you know small little problem which I have used earlier in my classes, but I don't think I've done it in BG five. So uh, let us say that you are walking along a particular uh, you know path. There are, there are railway tracks are running. Okay, and Suddenly, and you are near the, um, this is a part of the scenario, okay? You are near the uh, lever. You know the lever, there's a lever which you can pull so that the track, track changes, you know? Train goes another track. Yes. But you are near the lever, your hand can touch the lever, right? And then in front of you, you see that uh, there are there's two trains are coming. And one train is coming on, I mean, one train is coming. And there are, it, it can be moved on to either track. Okay. Now, on one track, there is one person who is lying fallen down, or rather, let us say that he is trapped in that track, cannot get up. That is also part of the condition. You can't change the condition. He is trapped, trapped in that track, and he cannot get up. So he, right. Now, on the other track, you have three people who are trapped. So you have the choice of shifting the lever. To move one train to one track and the other, tra the both train, either onto one track or to the other track. In one case, one person will die. In another case, three people will die. You get the scenario? Yes, sir. There is no other choice. You can't, you can't say that I will say both because it's not possible. You can't say they will get up because it's not possible. That's part of the condition of the experiment. You have the choice only to pull the lever. You can pull the lever. To save one person, you can pull the lever to save three people. What will you do? Three people. Three people. Okay. Everybody agrees? So why yes. did that one person is not my no, no, own? No, like no, being no. Agniani? No, let me let me let me finish. <laughs> now yes. we'll change the condition of this uh, experiment a bit. The three people you don't know. But the one person is your very close relative. What do you do? Still, still save three people. But I, At least as a Vedantic. <laughs> but I think uh, if we normally our child will say you will see the person you know. That's the way those, those relatives. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that thought. Okay, this experiment has really no solution. <clears throat> but it illustrates what happens in real life. And why it has no solution, that you ought to come up with. Then that sh if you are able to come up with the right answer, it should answer a lot of questions in your mind. We will not do anything. <laughs> anyway, whatever I will, leave, has you, I will leave, leave you with that. Acharya ji, I have a question. Can you please ask? Yeah, please. So when we make that statement that Ishwara loves the Nyani the most, what does it actually imply? What does it imply? It means that he, Gyani is not, it's just a reiteration of the fact that Gyani is not different from Ishwara. When you see Ishwara loves Gyani the most, it means Ishwara is loving himself the most. Those two statements, of the, which are there in the last line of this, of this 17th verse, they are just mm -hmm. reinforcing the idea that self-love is the highest love and Ishwara is, when you are Ishwara, then Ishwara love is the highest love. It's just a reinforcement mm -hmm. statement from two different points, from the Gnani's point and from Ishwara's point. Statement is the same. Right. So when, when we say that Ishwara loves the Gnani the most, that is also self-love. Ishwara self-love it is. Mm. Ishwara remembers as much Mithya as you are. Yes. Okay, so this will stop for today. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamada Purnam Deva Om
Thank you, 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 Thank you,